Hello. Welcome, everybody. I'm Kyle Pope, editor and publisher of the Columbia Journalism Review. Thank you so much for joining us, um, especially at this moment in time, which is a sort of exhausting, um, demoralizing uh, moment um, for, for all of us, for the country. Um, but I think this conversation that we're having is is absolutely critical. Um, you know, what we're we're on this panel, uh, all journalists, and we we keenly believe in the power of journalism to hold institutions accountable, to raise voices of people who aren't otherwise heard, um, to focus attention on uh, reforms that are needed, and to come up with ideas for ways that we can move forward and local news in particular is incredibly important for that. So we think that this is an incredibly important conversation to be having. I'm thrilled to be here and we're joined by um, the people who are going to lead us forward, the people who are, who are going to help us sort of find a way uh, forward at a time when local journalism is really under siege. I'm joined today by Emily Bell, who's the director of the Tao Center for Digital Journalism, by Tasneem Raja from Oakland side, Jean Strauss, President of Strauss News, Stacey Marie Ishmael, Editorial Director of the Texas Tribune, and Farai Chidea, Program Officer in the Creativity and Free Expression team of the Ford Foundation. We'll talk a lot more to each of them in a minute. You should know just logistically that all of you are welcome to submit questions, to submit thoughts. We're gonna to get to as many of those as we can after we go through a quick overview um, from the panel. So let me start with Emily, my colleague at Columbia. Um, hello, Emily. Hi, Kyle. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. Um, Emily, um, this is the third in a weekly series uh, that we've been doing uh, called the Journalism Crisis Project. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us about what that is and um, what Tao's work around this is and what we're hoping to accomplish. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Uh, so the uh, Journalism um, in Crisis project started as many great journalism research projects do as a spreadsheet, uh, which is really just an attempt at this moment in time to capture everything that is happening in newsrooms. Uh, we're starting with uh, the United States and we're adding regions around the world as we go, uh, really over the course of the next year. Um, so it started off as a counting exercise, but obviously you can't capture the things that are really going on in newsrooms just with uh, raw data. You know, um, we, we thought that, and I remember Carl, you and I had this conversation about, this is gonna be a, a story that completely dominates our lives as journalists and researchers and educators. Um, and we, first of all, need to know what's going on. So I would uh, urge everybody who, who knows about changes in your newsroom, it's not just about jobs, losses and furloughs, uh, but it's also about other ways in which your newsroom is changing um, and, and let us know about it. Uh, so we, we know that we need to, uh, we know that we need to, 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 to know what's actually happening at this moment, what's lost. Um, but I'm so thrilled that we have the people that we have today because um, it's exhausting and depressing to see the tens of thousands of jobs that are going. Uh, and really sort of, I think part of this project is also shining a light on what are the things that we need? How, what do we need to advocate for? How can we rebuild? How can we transition old models into new models? And how can we make new models sustainable? and better. Um, I think that a lot of what we'll talk about today is just, um, you know, we've reflected a lot on the failure, not just the business failure, but, but other failures in journalism, um, and having new ideas, new momentum, and, and, and ideas for rebuilding uh, are as important now as they have, more important now than they've ever been. Thank you. Um, again, um, as, as we go along, put your thoughts in the Q&A um, function and we'll get to a, as many of them as we can. Let me start with Tasneem Raja from Oakland Side. Um, Oakland Side, for those of you who don't know, it's a local news outlet in the Bay Area that launched um, in March. Um, and um, um, it, it's, it's, it's really intended to sort of fill a void um, there. Um, Tasneem is the former executive editor and co-founder of the Tyler Loop, a nationally recognized nonprofit local news startup in East Texas. Again, proud to have another Texan or somebody at least from with Texas roots in this group. Uh, to seem welcome. 
Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for coming. So tell us a little bit about what, uh, what motivated the founding of Oakland side and what, what has been, um, what's been the experience of the last few weeks. Sure, absolutely. So our origin story, I think, is a really powerful one. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Berkeley side and um, also, I hope, with the Tyler Loop. The co-founders of Berkeley side, which launched in Berkeley, California, 10 years ago, and I came together in the summer of 2019 to create City Side, which is now a nonprofit organization that powers both Berkeley side and the Oakland side. And the thinking behind our Oakland project was, um, you know, I, it really doesn't even need to be spelled out, right? How can a city with the size, complexity, um, diversity, importance, history of Oakland not have a dedicated, independent news outlet wholly devoted to serving and covering the city? So Berkeley side had, um, you know, successfully established a model of sustainable, um, digital first, hyper-local news startup. My experience and Tyler really building from the ground up on a foundation of listening, on a foundation of, you know, community-centered, community-powered journalism. Uh, we felt that there was this incredible moment in which, um, we could start asking questions of Oaklanders about their news needs, about their information needs. We actually don't use the word news very often. We really talk more in terms of information to then build over many months a set of founding values, a set of um, how exactly we're going to shape our reporting agenda, how exactly we're going to build this team to be responsive to what we're hearing from Oaklanders. Our initial plan was to launch in late June of this year. And then, of course, in March, uh, way ahead of our schedules, the coronavirus pandemic hit. And we felt it was our duty to mobilize sooner. Um, this is where actually I think the power of this, this network that we have created under city side with Berkeley side and now the Oakland side really started to show its promise because we said, we've got a platform. Um, let's start reporting at Berkeley side while our own platform continues to be built. And so by that point, we had assembled, um, a, you know, we are a small team, but an even smaller team. At that point, it was really just myself and two editors. And um, we continued hiring and then just hit the ground running and started reporting on the impacts of the coronavirus on our city. And then, of course, two weeks ago, we, we pivoted again and started uh, covering the impacts and the questions and the, the nuanced perspectives and history that we need to bring to the coverage of this moment. And we are continuing still to report through Berkeley side. We did launch our own Twitter feed. Um, on Monday, I think we got like 4,000 Twitter followers over the course of three days, but we need to do a lot more. Most of our audience is not gonna be on Twitter. And we are aiming to launch our own standalone platform on June 15th. Um, and I'm really curious about your view on what the stories that you were telling that you're not seeing mm -hmm. um, in other outlets that are in the greater you know, Bay Area. I mean, um, I think one of the, one of the notions that has sort of taken hold around this whole collapse of local news thing is that it's been sort of, sort of like a, an act of nature or, or, that, or that local news outlets did, had no role in losing parts of their audience. Um, it's a controversial idea for, um, for a, a conversation like this, but I think it needs to be talked about. Um, can you talk about like what the void is that you're seeing from other outlets that are trying to cover, let's say, let's say the last two weeks? Yeah, you know, I, I I don't tend to start there. I tend to start with an you know with the position of how can we strengthen the entire local information ecosystem. Um, yeah. There are you know there are lots of people doing really great work out here. Mm -hmm. I would say that it is more a question of how are we going to be additive in this moment? How are we going to respectfully collaborate with the folks who are already doing really great work on the ground? Many of whom are not. Um, with, you know, mainstream traditional media outlets. Um, and how are we going to play a role in not just doing great work ourselves, but actually building up the entire, you know, the entire journalism capacity of this community. So I, I would just say, I know that's not really an answer to your question, but it's just not how I tend to, to think about it. 
Fair enough. Um, do you have any thoughts though on, on the additive part of it? Like where, mm -hmm. where can you guys add specifically to the conversations yeah. that are going on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one example I'm happy to share is we are um, partnering with El Timpano. El Timpano, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, is a phenomenal project that's been, um, that was launched about three years ago here in Oakland, led by Madeline Baer. Um, El Timpano is a, is a journalism platform that specifically serves uh, monolingual Spanish-speaking Latino residents of Oakland and beyond. And over the past several years, they've, um, you know, constructed they've built uh, an incredible network of relationships with community members who we, um, you know, just launching fresh on day one, I mean, you know, we, we would have to put in so much work to, to get there and, and you know, um, reach just a fraction, I think, of the audience that El Timpano has already built. We need to partner with them, and we hope that they will also benefit in partnering with us, where we can provide reporting resources, information resources that you know they don't have they can work with us to help surface um, questions voices perspectives story ideas from their community and also have a two-way dialogue back where our reporting then flows to you know the, um, the the community members that they have already built trusted relationships with and um, you know, I think that's just one example of how it's going to take partnerships and collaborations for us to be able to truly serve our mission um, this name, thanks a lot. We'll, I'll, we'll, I'll come back to you. Um, Jean Strauss is the president of Strauss News, which publishes 17 local newspapers in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Um, she is a former boss of mine. Um, so um, much loved um, figure in, in New York journalism. We miss you, Jean, we miss you. Jean, so good to see you. Um, Jean comes, uh, comes to us from a whole different perspective, uh, not a digital startup, a, um, um, a family-run, local, largely print um, newspaper business. Tell us um, what the last few months have looked like to you um, and sort of how you think about a, a, a chain like yours in this broader conversation. Well, let me just start by saying thank you so much, Kyle. We do miss you. Thank you for inviting me to be part of it today, and Emily as well. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to jump off what Tasneem said this has been a time of incredible collaboration for us. So we partner with people we previously would have considered to be our competitors um, to make sure that we're covering the widest range of local news in a bunch of our communities. So um, our weekly competitors in Manhattan, Kyle, um, AM New York, Metro New York, we're all working together to make sure that our audiences have um, the most local, most up-to-date information. It's been... Um, so that's one of the silver linings to this incredibly difficult time. It's been a very tough time. Um, we cut back staff, mostly production staff. Um, the papers are obviously a lot smaller because advertising has fallen about 50%, which is huge for us. Since um, COVID. Since COVID, yeah, since the, since the third week of March. And, um, but it hasn't gone down to zero. And our people are doing incredible things. I think um, our businesses are counting on us more than ever. They're too busy trying to restart their businesses or figuring out how to do takeout or whatever to worry about marketing. So if we go to them with ideas about how we can help connect them to our audience, they're like, yeah, 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 let's do that. Let's do that. Um, it's also been really stressful for our staff, but really energizing. Um, to be so critical, to be so needed. We have huge engagement with our print products and with our digital products, obviously, way up over the past. And people have expressed their appreciation in ways that maybe in better times, uh, people would take us for granted. So that's the flip side, the good news in all of these difficult times. It's been an exciting and important time to be in the business. Have you... Um what models or what structure or what funding ideas have you heard? Um, I mean, I began the whole thing by talking about um, this, you know, the, the, the local news around the country has taken such a big hit. Um, and there've been a lot of us that have been talking about this now for a couple of years or more. And you've certainly been engaged in a lot of these discussions. Has there been anything that sort of bubbled up to you even in the last few months? It's like maybe that is going to be the thing that could really help move the needle. 
So a couple of things. First of all, I thought in your first seminar, some of the remarks that Penny Abernathy made were really, really insightful. The distinction between um, the loss of journalists at the big papers, the big regional groups, um, and the lo loss of sort of newspapers at the hyper-local level. I actually think the more hyper-local, independently owned businesses around the country, um, newspapers, have weathered pretty darn well um, and have managed to hold up. They're very close to their communities. They're viewed as being essential. I think over the long haul, the answer is, I think it's a mixed metaphor, but like four-legged stool. Um, it's going to require businesses and communities that have enough of a business support a main street still to support the newspaper with advertising. It's going to be required that individuals are involved either in a subscription or membership or whatever you want to call it, pay, pay, paywall. I view, view that's all individuals helping support the effort. Um, and then I think local foundations are going to have to step up as well. Um, and philanthropy, I mean, it's going to be those four things that are going to take it to support um, a robust community, either digital or print news products. Um, thanks. All of that is, is worth like us coming back to all of those ideas. Uh, in fact, it, it transitions well to uh, Stacey Marie Ishmael, who's with us next. She's the editorial director of the Texas Tribune. Hello. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks. Happy to be here as much um, as one can be. Right. Um, well, tell us how how is the um, Texas Tribune thought about its coverage over the last couple of weeks? Uh, deeply and extensively. Um, I think one of the one of the key things, just for context for folks on the, the panel, I, I joined the Texas Tribune as the editorial director um, roughly a day and a half before the city of Austin shut down for coronavirus. And so we have been navigating through this as an entirely distributed newsroom, which has been its own, it's presented its own sets of challenges, but it's also made us, I think, much more empathetic to the realities of what different folks are going through, for example, with online education or how, you know, folks at UT, students or teachers are kind of like responding to this crisis. And so I think that this is one of those rare examples when journalists who are very often removed from the reality of what is going on have been unable to separate themselves from the story. And it's given a degree of empathy and understanding, which I find to be both important and very helpful. And it's something that I, I don't want us to lose. Um, one of the first things that we noticed in March, like probably every other media organization around the world, was that the number of people coming to us for news was one, off the charts, and two, re registering very different behavior from things we'd seen before, right? So we went from having X number of visitors mostly coming to us on mobile at certain times of the day to just like tremendous numbers of people hitting the homepage direct directly across all platforms. People subscribing to newsletters, people reading individual stories, people finding us through search. And we made a series of decisions as a news organization across the newsroom and our product and engineering teams to make sure that we were making it as easy as possible for these audiences new and existing to find exactly what kinds of news reporting analysis statistics data they were looking for and that meant you know making some tough decisions about okay we have we all, we are in an election year <laughs> there is a tremendous amount of news in texas around mail-in voting for example it was about to be hurricane season how are we going to manage all of these priorities and it's a conversation that i'm really glad we were able to have you know shout out to my chief product officer millie who is currently I'm doing her job from Queens because we weren't able to get her on a plane before New York mm. went into lockdown for being a real partner in helping us prioritize and triage. And I think for me, that's a really important thing that I want to emphasize, not just for local newsrooms, but for all newsrooms. Like you have to be in partnership with your your business teams and your product teams and your advertising teams to your point, Jeannie, about like, this is what we are doing. This is why we are doing it. And these are the decisions that we're going to have to make across the org to make sure that we are joined up and getting there. You know, one of the, um, 
the areas I think you have have um, a lot of insight in is um, the events business, which is huge for Texas Tribune um, and an important part of your branding, an important part of how people experience the brand. Um, that business, at least for now, is at, at your place and everywhere is sort of on hold. Um, the no? physical events business is on right. hold. <laughs> right. Our so virtual do, events business is real busy. <laughs> really? Tell us about yeah. that. Um, again, because we made decisions early, like we went to mandatory work from home before any of the shelter in place or stay at home orders in Texas, just mm -hmm. out of one, an abundance of caution and professional paranoia, but two, you know, there had been right around this time, various journalists um, at a specific conference who there were concerns that folks had been exposed to coronavirus and we just made the call like, look, you know, we are seeing community spread. We are going to take steps to keep our folks safe as quickly as we possibly can. And that also meant reckoning with the fact that we would not have access to our studio, which is, you know, kind of a key part of our events infrastructure and something we're very fortunate to have, but we still want to be helping people access information in the ways that they are looking for and hearing from a an epidemiologist or a public health official or you know your state rep or you like your judge is something that is really important to our audiences here and so we in march quickly had to figure out and you could you can tell from the first ones that we did that we were figuring it out um we quickly had to figure out how it was we were going to be able to put these events on in a way that wasn't kind of like a webinar for the sake of it but something that was appropriate for the format you know had a range of perspectives and insights and really answered an audience need and that helpfully was also something that our incredibly hardworking sponsorship team would be able to you know use as an opportunity for monetization like we have not been affected by the decline in programmatic advertising because we are generally like a handheld shop mm -hmm. um, and but we are still seeing softness in the market around you know sponsorship opportunities that would have been kind of like an easy conversation a couple of months ago so we are very alive to making sure that we are looking at ways to continue to provide excellent and useful journalism to our audiences and that we are continuing to find ways to fund that excellent and useful journalism in, you know, as sustainably as we can. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, this is a perfect um, transition to talk about funding and funders and philanthropy. Uh, Farai Chidea, as I mentioned, is a program officer in the creativity and free expression team at Ford. She's been a supporter of CJR, I'm happy to say. Um, Farai, welcome. Thank you, it's great so to see good. you. You too, you too. Um, how have, um, um, has your thinking about um, the, fun, you know, the, 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 the business structure of uh, local news um, or the, the different, the need for different local news voices, has it changed as a result of COVID and the, uh, the police violence and protests that have followed? Are you thinking about it differently or do you take a much longer view than that? Um, definitely not thinking about it differently, but seeing it as an acceleration. So Ford has really worked to optimize our journalism portfolio for media equity, which is the idea that everyone should have access to high quality news, including local news, and that people of you know, every race and class and ethnicity and um, you know, physical ability or disability should be newsroom leaders, managers, owners, operators, et cetera. So we had already really been working towards that. And because you know, Ford gives away about 10 million a year in journalism funds, but compared to a largely for-profit media industry, um, any single foundation can only make so much impact. But I think one thing that we've looked for is um, organizations that are modeling behavior that, behavior and leadership, as well as doing excellent work. So um, Documented, which is, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with them, a, a New York local and regional immigration mm -hmm. uh, investigative reporting outfit. 
um, has really taken a lot of leadership in using um, service journalism technology, you know, developing SMS text messaging responsive systems so people who are day laborers can get information. And it's a very different way. I think there's become this kind of intellectual purism in journalism, which actually isn't how it started. Journalism was viewed as very practical. And now mm -hmm. we're like, oh, anything practical is, is pandering. And it's like, no, people need practical information. So mm -hmm. I think we look at uh, innovative leadership like theirs. Um, we look at City Bureau with their um, documenters um, mm -hmm. project uh, where they're basically paying citizens to train as citizen journalists to record town hall meetings. Mm -hmm. I think- This is in Chicago, right? Yeah, they're based in yeah. Chicago, but they're spreading it as a kind of franchise model. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the architecture of journalism is changing. There is journalism, which is a product, either in the commercial or nonprofit world, and then there's journalism as a function of civil society. So something like City Bureau's work with citizen journalists is journalism as a function. It doesn't matter that the people who are doing the journalism are not journalists, air quote. They are doing journalism, so it is a civic function that citizens who are not full-time journalists can perform. And I think increasingly we need to realize that we need both. We need very, you know, wonderful established um, organizations that can give us synthesis, analysis, breadth of reporting, and we also need journalism as a function. And so something else I would point out is that we're not funding her, but, or at least not yet, but Heather Chaplin at the New School, her, um, you know, J and D lab journalism and design. She's talked about using community colleges as part of the key news information architecture. That's the kind of thing we need to think about. Like the old system is over. Doesn't mean that all of the old outlets are over. Anyone can evolve and change and be nimble. And I think, you know, I was extremely excited when um, Stacy Marie went to the Texas Tribune because with given her work history, her background in technology, her keen understanding of race and class and national origin. She's the kind of leader we need to see in newsrooms today. Um, so I'm all for the highly skilled, you know, very um, top of the line newsroom. I just need or to rethink information architecture for an era where a lot of places are not going to have a newspaper again ever. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Farai. Um, Emily, let me come back to you before we open it up to questions. And by the way, um, we, we have a lot of questions already coming in. Um, please keep adding them and we'll get to them as, as many of them as we can. Um, we haven't talked at all about um, the role, if any, of the platforms in the solution to some of what we're talking about, or at least a, an idea of how to move things forward. Um, and it relates to this, what Farai was just talking about, about the different sort of structural ways of thinking about this. What, what are you seeing, um, what is your level of optimism that they could offer something that will be helpful? Well, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I was actually going to ask, I was going to put my hands up and ask a question to uh, to, to Sneem on exactly this, which is uh, because Facebook and, and the Google uh, Digital News Initiative are part of the reason that Berkeley Science was able to, to expand. Um, you know, we've been researching this, this relationship a lot. I have reservations about it because um, I think particularly when you're in places like Northern California, where a lot of the uh, civic infrastructure, a lot of the demographics are directly impacted by the presence of very large corporations. You know, the traditional sort of journalistic whole power to account part of me thinks, if we're rebuilding, and I heard from everybody, and I really want to go back and hear more from the panelists on this, partnerships, networks, um, sort of interoperability between different parts of civic society. I thought what Farai said was absolutely spot on about, you know, this is a civic function. Um, you have these, uh, you have technology companies who, first of all, are throwing a lifeline when no other exists. So let's just acknowledge that, that, you know, actually they are, putting money in at the moment. I think that the problem with that is, is that there's no sort of security in that. Um, we see that they are very much led by priorities which are non-journalistic at a corporate level. Um, I think that there are some issues around conflict of interest, but I think when we're refiguring what these partnerships look like and how we can build this infrastructure, um, there is a big question, which is should those organizations be con 
sort of directing the conversation, which to some extent they are at the moment, or should we be, you know, finding ways to um, take their money, um, but also sort of keep them at arm's length? So I don't know whether kind of Tesney wants to wants to tackle that one. It's a little bit unfair asking you directly about your own funders, but it must be a question. I'm happy that, to that also up. answer that question. Great. Okay, yeah. that's good. Either, okay. either. Tesney, yeah. let's start with you, and then we'll go to Stacey Marie. So you know, for the past three years, I. Um, working out of East Texas, you know, working essentially by myself, no money, no salary, no support, uh, churning out, you know, working with um, mostly non-journalists on the ground and, and training people in journalistic methods and storytelling methods um, to cover segregations, uh, school segregation, um, healthcare access, mental health care access, you know, what the future of this deeply diverse but deeply segregated city looks like um, in in the in the regional hub of you know one of the biggest swaths of one of the most complicated and important states in the country, and I was just doing this entirely on my own, no support, no funding. Um, to really keep us going. And it was incredible what we were able to achieve in that time, you know, uh, and, and, and also I think the national attention that we were getting on our work. But at the end of the day, it's not sustainable. I just, I couldn't keep going that way. I'm happy to say that the Tyler Loop does continue. I'm now on the board, we have a new executive director, but you know, it will always be a, okay, we can do another year. Can we do one more? Uh, maybe we get to a point where we just can't keep going. So I saw what I was able to achieve with no resources. And, you know, I came to East Texas after having been at NPR, having been at um, Mother Jones, and, you know, certainly at NPR in a situation where we had a lot of resources, um, but operating within, you know, a much larger organization where it was, it's, it's very hard in a large organization to be really nimble and truly responsive to on the ground communities, you know, especially working out of the NPR headquarters in BC, we're just not really always built to do that in a way that local newsrooms are. So this opportunity felt like a way of kind of bringing it all together to say, okay, we built this, I believe, astonishingly powerful reporting unit in East Texas, fueled by, you know, fumes. And we have an opportunity now to start with the kind of initial seed funding that we have seen some of the successful statewide and national nonprofit digital first startups launch with that get, you know, praised left and right and held up as models for, hey, this is what everybody should be doing, right? Um, we've seen sustainability here what's it going to take now to bring this down to the local level? Well, what it's going to take is investment. What it's going to take is money to hire staff, to hire editors, to hire reporters and audience directors and product directors and technologists to be truly responsive to the needs of our communities. Um, so what have we done so far, right? I, I'm looking back at our coverage as we're talking over the past week and I'm seeing we did, uh, you know, with our team of reporters, we're now seven. We are a majority people, of, uh, we are a, a team that is uh, majority journalists of color, um, majority, uh, majority folks who've been in Oakland. And we have been reporting, for instance, on, you know, just yesterday, one of our reporters called nearly 40 pharmacies across the city to say, are you open? Are you operating right now or not? Because we know that Oakland just lost access to a slew of pharmacies in the middle of a viral pandemic. I'm looking at um, our history of curfews. We did this deep dive into the history and um, wider context of how curfews have long been used to quell pain and fury in communities of color in response to moments just like this. This is the kind of work you just can't do in a sustained fashion without investment. So the question of who's investing, who's stepping up to support, yes, that's absolutely a conversation that needs to be had. Um, but I, I hope that we'll also trust the journalists um, who step up to lead and join these kinds of operations to say, we are coming in with a lot of 
deeply thoughtful, deeply intentional conversation about what it means to be funded by the Google News Initiative and to be funded by the American Journalism Project. We're not just saying, um, okay, sure, <laughs> I guess we'll take your money and you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. We're having a lot of conversation about this. We're talking to our communities about this. We are um, creating internal processes that we will be making public to say, what does editorial independence, what does editorial integrity look like in this moment? And we're also doing the work that the response from our community has been overwhelming to say you are filling a void. So I would say, please let's have this conversation about who is stepping up to invest. Um, but please let's also acknowledge that the work, the work needs to be done. The communities are asking for this work to be done. And I hope that we can push and encourage, um, you know, a wide variety and a wide spectrum of types of initial seed funders to step up, step to the plate, get involved. Don't just give us the, you know, don't just, don't just give us these grants that are, are really not going to enable us to be transformative. Um, give us money to hire a real team of journalists mm. and get to work because otherwise, you know, I've seen what happens to so many of these operations. I've seen what happens when I was trying to get the Tyler loop going and, and to be sustainable. It's just, you're always just grasping for tomorrow and you can't dream. You can't think big. I wanted to get sort of, oh, sorry, Kyle. I, I, I wanted to sort of come to, to Stacey uh, Marie on that question as well, who said I can, <laughs> I can answer it. But I thought you touched on something so important there, Tessling, which is something we've been looking at in our research as well, which is just the disclosure of these relationships and how they thought about in newsrooms and, and, and are people thoughtful about them um, is something which I feel that most of the practice hasn't quite got to yet. Um, but that uh, exactly that sort of thinking and leadership I think will hopefully get us there so I don't know Stacey Marie you were you had something yeah, to say about I mean, platforms. All, all funders are potential sources of conflict <laughs> all funders right and it is right and appropriate to note that technology companies have a disproportionate effect on media um, and distribution and audiences and that we are often in a um, a deep struggle to survive in the advertising industry because of decisions that have been made and enabled by technology platforms. It is also true that they are in varying ways at different degrees of millions and thousands stepping up to donate to enable this work to happen. Like we have personally been very fortunate beneficiaries of a significant grant from Facebook that has made it possible to, you know, create the, our revenue lab or rev lab um, with the goal of helping other media organizations, particularly nonprofits and local media organizations, learn and understand, hey, here's what we've tried that has worked for us. And here's what we've tried that has not worked for us. Here's how this may be applicable to you. At the same time, as someone who has also worked at a technology company, I am like, on the record as saying the most meaningful things that tech companies can do for journalism is make product changes, right? Like there is, you would have to be getting into the hundreds of millions of dollars in donations for the kinds of effects that they could have if they were to change what are relatively minor in the grand scheme of road mapping, some of the decisions that inform how they think about their products, who they let our stories get in front of, the audiences that they introduce to us, the kinds of access to our, what we would consider to be first party data that they do not consider to be first party data. And that's absolutely where I think the conversation needs to continue in terms of how tech companies can show up as it relates to journalism. I think that's, For, uh, I think, I'm sorry. I just think, I think that's a great point. And I think, um, you know, Google announced a round of giving out $5,000 grants. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speechless to support local journalism when a tiny little change could really change the local news industry. Um, in their program, programmatic ads, for example, if they weren't allowed to, you know, be holding all of our data about all of our readers, um, and if program, you know, cigarette advertising was once upon a time legal, if programmatic advertising was not legal, it would all be a completely different game. Um, Jean, I want to come back to you in a second because there's been a few questions from people in the audience about your comment about how you're 
uh, cooperating with former competitors. But but before we get off of this uh, this point about uh, funders and the ties and the tensions, I feel like um, um, I would really like to hear from Farai on this. I mean, my assumption is that the future path of local news is going to have to include more philanthropic funding and more foundation funding. Um, what are you seeing? And I mean, um, the the, the description that Tasneem used to the, the sort of rigor and the transparency of how they think about these tensions is interesting to me. Are you seeing other people doing the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I think what I would say is that um, I do believe that philanthropic investment in news is very important, but I still think that in the end, news and information will be a for-profit driven industry. You know, so I've worked at CNN, ABC, um, MTV News, Oxygen, <laughs> all these for-profit companies, plus in public radio. And um, I was at ABC when it was bought by Disney, and someone explained a simple piece of math to me, which was, oh, well, the entertainment unit yields about 25% in revenue, and the news unit yields about 7%. So we're being asked to level up to the entertainment yield. Mm -hmm. And um, so that is pretty much ridiculous um, in terms of, you know, it, that, that's not the economics of news. And I'm not, um, I'm not delusional about what for-profit news is and isn't, but I also think that philanth philanthropy can't save the news. Mm -hmm. um, we have to begin to think of philanthropy as a lever for incentivizing new models and information systems that then ripple across the industry. And that's really one way that we've looked at the portfolio and also with a, a research um, focus. So we have a landscape analysis coming out at the end of the month at Ford, looking at innovation in the service of media equity. I will say with 100% personal certainty, and your mileage may vary, that if we had heeded the Kerner Commission report 52 years ago, the news media would be different. It would be integrated. We'd have um, some sense of class. And we would never have boxed, our, boxed ourselves into the corner that we have now, where during the last, last election cycle in 2016, Les Moonves, who's now disgraced, but at the time was a big man, um, said that Trump is not good for America, but he's good for CBS. And he said some version of that in two different earnings calls. And it was reported and leaked. And still, somehow, he was viewed as fit to run that news division. I mean, obviously, he wasn't just over the news division. But so I am not, um, again, uh, without reservations about the challenges of for-profit news. But I think the problem, among many, has been that philanthropy has been asked to save an industry that it doesn't control. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, a toddler being asked to supervise their parents. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to say it that way, but like, we need to do what we can do in the nonprofit mm -hmm. world, world, which is to innovate, show new pathways, produce excellence, and serve the public. But we can't rescue the journalism industry. So mm -hmm. I just thought I'd lay that out there. I don't know if that's where we were going. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to try now to get to as many of these questions as I can. Jean, somebody asked you to, if you could spell out in a little more detail the way that you're cooperating with uh, former competitors and how that's working. Um, it's working well. Uh, it's not as robust as we would have hoped, but we've agreed that um, during the shutdown, for example, that we weren't going to send two reporters to the governor's press conference or the mayor's press conference every day. We were going to send one reporter and send a the other person's reporter to do something else, to do some other reporting. I mean, those kinds of common things where, you know, do we really need 10 people sitting there at the uh, governor's press conference, which is being broadcast live? And is that a good use of our reporting uh, abilities at any individual time? So that kind of thing. And picking up each other's stories, you know? Yeah. Um, uh Somebody asked how local journalists can better plan to, to address meeting citizen needs regarding the converging crises of COVID and the, the general election disinformation, what, whether there are resources that can be shared. Um, um, regarding the election in particular, has anybody seen interesting, I know there's Election Land, which is a, a um, right, project which of is, which is a, Mark, ProPublica and others. Right. Yep. Um, other than that, is it, I mean, has anybody else seen any interesting models around election coverage or dis disinformation coverage? Um, 
a few things. One of the one of the most effective things that newsrooms can do is flood the zone with legit information, mm -hmm. because disinformation and misinformation absolutely thrive in a vacuum. And when we are vague, when we are non-specific, when we write headlines that do not contextualize, you know, comments that are themselves misleading, we are in fact contributing to the problems of misinformation and, and disinformation in our own reporting or failure to report. And so, you know, making sure that we are 100% on top of this is what's actually happening and this is how you can find out um, in, in your particular communities is, is essential. I think the other thing that we generally as an industry is really bad at is our, um, we are generally quite monolingual. All right, I wanna mm -hmm. shout out to the um, Center for Community Media at like, Newmark J, which is one of the only places that is currently organizing and uh, resourcing and helping the variety of community news newspapers, and they are largely newspapers, though they are some online as well, that publish in languages other than English. And, you know, just at the Texas Tribune, one of our reporters published a story a couple of days ago around the fact that so much of the really essential coronavirus and public health information is not being actively translated, even in a state like Texas. And this is also true for California, Arizona, and others. And so understanding that where we can make our stories available and accessible, even if that means thinking through who we can partner with, who may be able to translate these resources, how we might, if we have a traditionally, um, if we have an audience in a place that doesn't have broadband, but they have a lot of access to broadcast, right? Mm -hmm. Like how can we get our stories in front of those kinds of audiences? Can we put our reporters on TV more? Like, can we get our reporters on radio? Um, how can we, you know, it, whether it's the example that you shared earlier of using text messaging. I think understanding that it's not only about combating the false information, it's about providing things that are accurate and making sure that the people who would most benefit from seeing that can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I could, I'd like to add to that. I think that is just so spot on and it's, you know, how we show up for our communities in our coverage of the impacts of the coronavirus crisis on our community is going to affect how they see us um, and how much they're going to tune in when we show up in this moment that we're in right now. Um, and all of that is going to have knock on effects. Yeah. As the months go by, if we didn't show up properly for coronavirus, if we didn't show up properly for uprisings against police brutality, they're not going to tune in and they're not going to mm -hmm. trust us. They're not going to help us flood the zone with real information by sharing our work and getting involved in our work when it comes to elections. So I think we cannot look at these story cycles in, um, in a vacuum. We cannot look at them in isolation. We have to understand that each of these has an audience building um, role where if you mess up your context, your frame, your narrative, once, you know, I mean, so many people have been saying it recently. I think maybe Stacey Marie, you, you may have even tweeted this, you know, uh, the, the time it takes to build trust compared to the fraction of an instant in which it takes time to lose that trust and then you spend forever rebuilding it. Um, we've just been so, you know, as I said, we didn't expect to start reporting uh, until late June. We've been reporting since March because we knew if we don't show up, um, during this crisis, why are they going to tune in? Why are people going to tune in when we do finally show up and start reporting on the election? Yeah, Emily, do you, I, I just, I'm sorry, go ahead, Farai. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. Um, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but um, it, Stacey Marie um, put something on Twitter that I retweeted basically about how the expertise of Black reporters is often dismissed because it's like, well, of course you think that. And that there's this endless cycle of basically, if you're a black reporter, you are Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill to try to reach the mountain of truth. And then it kind of rolls back on you. And then six months later, someone was like, wow, that was a pretty heavy boulder. Um, we have to get better as an industry. We have been stuck on stupid with um, these false notions of objectivity. And I believe in fairness. So one. I did a training yesterday for um, a major newsroom around how to cover this era. And there were 200 people on, which I didn't know until I started getting emails from people. But basically, you know, I talked about how when I interview white supremacists, which I have many different times in person and remotely, um, I am not objective about white supremacy as an ideology, but I am fair. I do yeah. not depict them to be different than they are. I am a reporter and I'm there to um, understand them and depict them fairly. What has happened in America is that we have seemed to think that everyone who is in some ways non-normative to 
Um, I'm just going to be frank and I don't care if I sound like an SJW or whatever. Um, cisgender, white, upper middle class male. That is the normative journalist in, in terms of who gets authority in the newsroom. Um, and I have found it incredibly frustrating to just do my job. And so right now what I'm seeing across uh, black Twitter, white Twitter, articles like the one that Stacey Marie was just in, in Glamour talking to black reporters mm. is this wave of like, why didn't you believe us when you had the chance? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that if nonprofit journalism can do something, it is again in modeling best practices and behaviors and funders have to be aware that where our money goes matters. And that if we are not supporting organizations that do equitable hiring um, and feature content that really discusses America as it is, um, we've lost the game. So I do think, you know, this, this landscape analysis that Ford has coming out really talks about the whole infrastructure of how you create innovation and also where for-profit funding um, comes in because uh, I think part of what has to happen is that hopefully some for-profit journalism organizations will begin to look at the successes of innovative nonprofits and say how can we gather some best practices but um, I just think overall covering this era requires a bit of reflection and humility on the part of the entire journalism profession that we did not reform ourselves after the Kerner Commission report which said we had to and we didn't and now we're here so what are we doing for 50 years from now? Mm -hmm. um, I, just, I just wanted very quickly just to relate what um, Farai said to uh, uh, what just Neiman, uh, Stacey Marie said, which is um, we've had, since 2016, we've had uh, this sort of obsession, fetishization of disinformation and misinformation. Um, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but w what we're seeing is a lot of funding going into playing what I would call whack-a-mole, and almost no funding going into exactly the things that everybody on this panel has been talking about, which is how do you look at the whole picture and how do you start with newsroom uh, reform and how do you actually fund that in a sustainable way? Um, and I know there's lots of sort of great work that fact-checking organizations do and I think that you know we should have more fact-checking organizations but we're seeing a binary at the moment which says we have to fight misinformation. I really want people to make the case that says really really excellent journalism fights misinformation and we have to know what that excellence looks like and we have to fund it because at the moment we fund a lot of disinformation projects but to me we're sort of missing a piece of this which is you know what's what's really effective and exactly as uh, Tasneem, um, Stacey and uh, Stacey Miriam for I say it's having better newsrooms understanding their communities and and being all over the it's, issues it's having that they better newsrooms about. you can't you can't fight this information if you have no reporters right if you exactly. are exactly a news exactly. organization in cleveland and your reporting desk has gone to zero like you're doomed but you you could have a hundred phenomenal reporters and no trust and i think the the other piece of this to farai's point and to tasneem's is we have also not necessarily done the work to show people why they should trust us um, which is not about like journalists are great. So like, you, you don't have to care about individual journalists being great. You have to believe that what you are seeing reflects what you are seeing. And when there is a constant disconnect between those two things, it's very hard to convince someone that you know what you're talking about. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I just, I love the way you put it. I've, and this will stick in my head for sure. It's it, the best way to combat disinformation is flooding the zone with good information. And, you know, I think when we get, when we talk about what we do as news, as reactive, as, you know, we've got to follow the story, I think we're missing opportunities to say, how are we driving the conversation? How are we anticipating people's hopes and fears and dreams and concerns? And asking the questions um, of, of, you know, and, and being really intentional about yeah. who we're asking, whose input are we getting? Whose questions are we capturing? Um, 
to show up for people in a way where it's not just that we are, I, I think sometimes in the disinformation conversation, we're still just reacting, right? We're still chasing something that somebody else is doing, trying to catch up and say, no, no, we're here too. Let's get ahead of it. Let's drive the conversation. Let's be the place where we're answering people's questions, you know, like even getting ahead and saying, where, where do we know people are going to be tomorrow? How can we start doing that work today? And um, um, one of the best ways to get there is to have, you know, create spaces where readers can truly drive your coverage in an intentional, thoughtful, and mutually beneficial way. Um, we promised people we would take an hour here, and it's three minutes to one. Um, with the, um, if the panel wouldn't mind, just go in just a few minutes over because I want to just get to a couple more questions um, before we wrap up. Um, sure. One of the um, is everybody okay with that? Um, one of the questions I wanted to get to um, on here goes back to the uh, philanthropy idea. It's from Carol Boger. Hello, Carol. Um, who notes that there's there seems to be some national philanthropy for local needs, but much less local philanthropy. Um, why is that? And has anybody seen any signs of that changing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, I think that there is increasing interest uh, of local funders. The reality is that most community-based foundations don't have a specific journalism program officer and often are intimidated by the complex matrix of choices in front of them for what they fund. Like, um, you know, do you try to work with the local you know, small paper, the big paper? You know, there's, you know, I won't get into all the different things, but for example, there was a big wave um, well, it, it leads to me a big wave of funding for-profit newsrooms to basically cover specific topics. And what yep. happened, which I think was pretty predictable, was that those newsrooms covered them as long as there, there was money. There was and funding. You know, and, and that's not even necessarily bad math, but there was this assumption like, oh, if we seed it, they'll run with it. It's like, mm, not necessarily. And so mm -hmm. I think that there's a different issue around local funders, which is like people say, where do I place my bets? And I think that there is a role for, um, there's certainly groups like media impact funders, but there's a role for entities, intermediaries, advisors who speak to community foundations about what their stake is. First of all, are they looking for primary impact? Meaning, are they looking for impact on the field of journalism? Or are they looking for secondary impact? Impact on local housing policy or taxation, et cetera. Those are two very different ways of funding. So I think that there is a, there's, there's an increasing amount of um, people on this learning curve of how you do local investments in news. And I think it's actually exciting. I actually think that, um, I think it was Pew, it did a study recently that showed how few people know that their local uh, for-profit journalistic enterprise is under financial pressure. Yep. And that the reason there have been so few uh, local foundations, local philanthropy, is because they haven't, they haven't made a good case for um, the fact that the community needs us to survive and that we're under pressure. So I think it's the onus is largely on us having not gone specifically to them to tell our story. Anybody else have any thoughts on local funding? Um, you know, before, let, let's go around and I'm gonna let everybody um, uh, answer this final question. I mean, I began this by saying that I think this, these crises that we've seen these uh, in the last uh, few months have, have highlighted and reinforced why local journalism is so important and that um, and that um, I think that viewers and readers see it too. Um, I could be wrong about that though. Um, so how do we reinforce that? Um, and some of you have already sort of tackled this issue having to do with making sure that we're telling the stories of people whose stories need to be told, making sure that the people that are telling the stories, that are, who are telling the stories are reflective of the communities they cover. Uh, but any other thoughts about how we can sort of better make that case and, and sort yeah, of connect have, those dots? I think national media could give credit to local orgs more. I think one of, one of the biggest ways that people understand why something is important and where it is coming from is when they read it in the pages of the New York Times. And there is a historical 
reticence in our industry to generously attribute, even though very many times it is the local news organizations that are significantly less well-funded and less well-positioned who are breaking those stories, who are doing the doorstepping, who are there, who are doing the reporting, who are sending the photographers and who continue to live there after whatever we define as a story is over. But if all you ever see in parentheses, maybe on a good day is like, you know, initially covered maybe a hyperlink and there is no sort of notion of acknowledging where this work is coming from it makes it harder you put the, the onus of all the marketing back on the local news orgs who generally don't have marketing budgets in the first place just name yeah i would say that um some of the most interesting inspiring work that I am seeing right now is certainly happening. Um, you know, Jean, you talked about this idea of review, you know, re-seeing competitors as collaborators. Um, I think that anything we can do to further define and tell the story of, to our communities of what that means, you know, as journalists, we're we're often very good at telling the stories of, um, you know, issues we're covering, sometimes not so good, right? Uh, you know, we try to be good at telling the stories of the communities we aim to serve. We're often terrible at telling our own stories. And I think that this is one space where this is parlance that we've gotten very comfortable with, or some of us have gotten very comfortable with this, oh, collaborations, partnerships, explain to your community what you're what doing. What that means, yeah. You know, tell, you know, when we launch our site, um, we aim to have a how we work category Category that is like listed alongside the rest of our beat. So what do we cover? We cover arts and community, housing and homelessness, education equity, uh, city hall and policing, um, and uh, public health and environmental impacts. And then right alongside of it, how we work. And we need to do a really good job there of telling the story of, okay, when we say we're built on a foundation of listening, what the hell does that mean, right? Like that means something to us as a, uh, to me as a journalist, but what does that mean to the public? You know, so I think it's, um, really reporting on our own work uh, through an accessible, clear lens that is that is rich in storytelling and rich in inviting people to get involved and not assuming that other people understand what we're trying to do behind the scenes. You know, start with why, explain why we're doing it. And um, if, we're, if we're getting into spaces that feel new and exciting, like collaborations and partnerships, let's make sure our communities understand the work that goes into it and why they might be interested in supporting that work. Thank you, uh, Jean. I don't have too much to add, Kyle, except um, I want to do a shout out for professional journalists who are good listeners, make all the difference. And um, it's all very well and good to sort of talk about um, different ways of getting the news in. I still think we need professional journalists that understand the pressures and the um, whole objectivity, fairness, all those concerns um, in our newsroom helping before the information gets flooded out, flooded, flooding the zone. Yep. Uh, Farai. Well, I will do my fifth promotional, like we have a landscape analysis coming out at the end of the month. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully you'll be on some distribution list for it. I think that looking at- Storytelling. Um, <laughs> pardon? You're good at yeah, story, exactly. telling your own story. Exactly, exactly. Never, never miss a PR opportunity. But I mean, it's been fascinating doing research while on a moving train of history. We mm -hmm. did, we started this research seven months ago. It was supposed to be published in April. We rebooted for COVID and refocused and did some new interviews. No one knows the future. I think that what we have to do is have values and to me, you know, being a journalist has been amazing and frustrating and all of the all of the things. But it's to me a value proposition around how I communicate with other people and and also the truths I tell myself. You know, I have confirmation bias sometimes around certain issues, but I can look in the mirror and say, you're being biased right now. What are you going to do about it? I think that we have to have humility as journalists and funders and newsroom leaders about who we are and what we bring to the table. And look at this as a great adventure that we don't know the ending to. Emily, you get the last word. 
I would just say copy all of the above and thank you so much to the panel for all of their insights. I just sort of really hope that we can harness this kind of energy and momentum. I mean, the one thing I would say is that maybe we'll have a change of administration in November. We don't know this as Farai says, nobody knows the future. Uh, one thing, and I'll pick up on something that Stacey said and that, that all the panelists, you know, did thumbs up to, which is, all of these, um, everyone is doing, I think, amazing work in newsrooms at the moment. Um, you know, on this panel, I kind of read all of your work uh, and it's really sort of an extraordinary thing. But well, I think we also need really big systemic changes. Um, we need big systemic changes from the platforms. We need big systemic changes in how uh, wealth is redistributed from maybe the kind of profit-driven profit media. Um, and we probably need some changes as well in law and we need some thoughts uh, about how we might want to make journalism sustainable in the same way that we made journalism sustainable in large parts of the world after the Second World War by thinking about how you have a system that, constant, that isn't just left to chance. Because my big worry is that unless we make those big changes, then all the really fantastic things that happen a million times a day that journalists are driving, uh, will actually sort of still be driven out, if you like, by the kind of by the by the by the forces of uh, of not such good things. Sorry, that's a down. I can't I can't finish panels without a down note, but um, <laughs> I, I have to say it's been a great conversation. Pessimism. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> but thank, thank you all. Thank you, Tasneen. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Stacey Marie. Thank you, Farai. Thanks to everyone who came on to listen. Um, Keep an eye out for the, the, the next weekly installment of this conversation with um, Emily and Tao and myself and CJR, um, which will be a week from today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carl.